All right, uh, I will call the meeting of the State Fire Prevention and Building Code Council to order. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, to begin the meeting, let's uh, let's call the roll of the council. Mark, could you call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Ron Keister, representing Secretary of State, Cesar Corrales. Here. Paul Martin, representing State Fire Administrator, Brian Stevens. Here. Michael Cambridge, representing Commissioner Nirav Shah. Here.
of 2014. I'd like to personally thank uh, Director Peaster and uh, Tony as Representative of uh, Secretary of State Corrales. Thank you for uh, moving these codes forward with the most recent addition. Uh, a little background on the uh, International Association of Electrical Inspectors. Since 1928, we've been a core leader in the electrical industry and has actively promoted safe products and safe installations. Active members and partners in the association, which is international, include many diversified contractors. The association has a long and recognized history in comprehensive training in and promotion of safe products, electrical installations, and inspections in order to ensure compliance with electrical codes and standards. More than 6,000 individuals participate in certification and upgrading training sessions in the United States and Canada each year. IAEI training is coordinated through the International Office in Texas, sections and local IAEI chapters and divisions. The International Office provides publication, certification, testing, and training. The basic mission statement is, as the keystone of the electrical industry, it's membership-driven, nonprofit association <coughs> promoting electrical safety through the industry by providing premier education, certification of inspectors, advocacy, partnerships, and expert leadership in electrical codes and standards development. IAEI is also uh, joined with an electrical code coalition, and uh, they've recently launched a website. The Electrical Code Coalition promotes widespread adoption of the NEC. Its current members are Edison Electric Institute, the Electrical Safety Foundation International, Independent Electrical Contractors, International Association of Electrical Inspectors, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, National Armored Cable Manufacturing Association, National Electrical Contractors Association, National Electrical Manufacturers Association, and National Fire Protection Association, and also Underwriters Laboratory. Uh, on June 11, 2003, they announced the launch of a new website, which aims to facilitate direct and full adoption application and uniform enforcement of the latest of NFPA 70, the National Electrical Code. The NEC sets the standard for safe electrical installations in homes, businesses, institutions, and industry. As one of the founding members of the National Electrical Code, NECA, continues to support its mission and works to promote uncompromised adoption of the National Electrical Code in the interest of consumer safety. Uniform codes and standards enhance electrical safety by providing consistent requirements across the jurisdiction. The coalition committed to the NSC adoption throughout the United States to better protect consumers and those who work on electrical systems. Unforeseen hazards direct impact our ever-changing electrical environment. That's why the IAEI fully supports the direct and adoption of the latest edition of the National Electrical Code and its commitment to an electrical safety system that protects persons and properly from potential shock and fire hazards. The ECC website provides the necessary tools to ensure that our new products, technologies, and systems will indeed make our communities a safer place to live. Expanded and use of the most current of the NEC is central to improving electrical safety for all, which is why ESFI supports the adoption so vigorously. The new resource provided by the Electrical Code Coalition website to help stakeholders take an active role in adoption or strengthen their efforts will help move electrical safety forward. Thank you, and uh, if you have any questions, I think uh, Mark will probably get a hold of me. Okay. Thank you very much. Also, I have in my hand the uh, analysis of changes of, for 2014 NEC. And, and this is the analysis of changes, which also includes the analysis of changes from NEC 2011. So it's not that thick, but this is just the analysis. Thanks again. Thank you. I've been uh, I've been informed that uh, that we're having uh, 
some continued technical difficulties. Unfortunately, the the uh, the meeting is not being recorded at this time. Unfortunately, uh, that is going to force us to postpone the meeting for a few minutes while we wait for uh, <laughs> for this difficulty to be uh, solved. So I apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, however, we're going to take a five-minute break and see if we can uh, resolve this, get get the recording back online, and then we will continue the meeting. Problem with the webcast. Are able to get the sound. I don't know what you were just saying, but I apologize for interrupting. Whatever I just said, please forget. <laughs> <what I'm laughs> <talking about. laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. We're now fully in compliance with the open meeting law, so uh, so we can proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, would you please call the next speaker? Yes. Next speaker is Dominic Kosmowskis, uh, speaking on uh, sprinkler systems. Morning. Dominic Kosmowskis, National Fire Sprinkler Association. Uh, I just want to be brief uh, and keep the discussion open on residential fire sprinklers, as noted before. A um, couple of things, uh, I don't know if anybody saw the YNN broadcast the other day of the live side-by-side -side burn that took place in Latham, New York at the Colony Fire Training Center. Um, uh, some commentary was made after the live burn shots uh, by some uh, uh, another entity. Uh, some, of this, uh, some of the notations made by the other en entity was that because of the live burn being outside with one wall open, which is kind of what you need to get into a living room is having something open, uh, that there was more oxygen feeding into that demonstration the other day. It's absolutely incorrect. I was a firefighter for 32 years. Uh, 14 of those years I was single, which is I made a lot of fire calls, or maybe that's the reason why I was single. But um, that's how fires operate. I, there's, there's nothing to do with the, fire, with the fire scenario with one wall being open or being outdoors or anything that there was more oxygen being let into the room making the demonstration more dramatic. Uh, there was also a notation about smoke alarms. NFPA report from 2011, uh, uh, almost all households in the U.S. have at least one, one smoke alarm, yet 2005 to 2009, um, smoke alarms are present in less than three quarters of the households, and you have the letter in front of you about going through all the statistics. We still have a third of the fire deaths in this country in homes with working smoke alarms. All right, so smoke alarms are not the final answer to the fire problem in this country. We know what the next step is, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's time to move towards that step at the appropriate time. Uh, we still have 2,600 people dying in this country overall every year. We come down from that eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 we had every year going back in the 70s and 80s, and a lot of that is due to smoke alarms, but we've plateaued off. So, you know, obviously 2,600 times a year, smoke alarms aren't working. And we, I really uh, implore New York to make that next step to go forward. Uh, California is going into their fourth year. California has not slid off into the ocean. Home builders have not gone out of business. Not thousand carpenters on the unemployment line. Housing has not stopped in the state of California. Housing is actually 37% above projection for housing starts. And I can get anybody you want from California at a future meeting to talk about what has happened in California the last three years and how they, uh, how they implemented it with their uh, ramp up time and their education, et cetera. And actually, California just implemented a uh, three-year window of opportunity for plumbers to get into the residential fire sprinkler business uh, to get them uh, instructed and taught and uh, to, to move this forward because California did have a little bit of a glitch in the rural areas and trying to get enough fire sprinkler contractors or fire sprinkler fitters up into some more rural areas. Uh, so, there was some, and, uh, so there was some special uh, legislation passed for the licensure. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, in New York State, we don't have that issue. We don't have statewide fire sprinkler contractor uh, licensure, which is a whole other discussion. Uh, again, you have my letter in front of you. But thank you for your time. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Larry Levine at the New York City location speaking on the plumbing code. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Larry Levine. I'm with Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, which is a national and international environmental organization. Uh, we're based here in New York City. Um, we have over 37,000 members uh, in New York State. Um, I wanted to speak in regard to the uh, uniform code updates, um, and in particular the, uh, the plumbing 
section of the residential code, actually, uh, and specifically in regard to high efficiency toilets. Um, I'm, uh, I'd like to ask the council uh, to consider including an updated standard for high efficiency toilets in the upcoming code revisions. Um, in the current code, the maximum flow rate for toilets uh, is set at 1.6 uh, gallons per flush, and that's based on nationwide standards that were enacted nearly 20 years ago. Um, today, however, tank type toilets that perform well at lower flush volumes are widely available. Uh, and so we therefore request the state adopt a standard of 1.3 gallons per flush, which is based on US EPA's water sense performance criteria. Um, water sense, is, as you probably know, is a voluntary labeling program uh, that promotes uh, and recognizes products that are substantially more efficient than federal minimum requirements uh, while maintaining full uh, performance and functionality and customer satisfaction. Um, seven years ago, in, in January 2007, uh, WaterSense issued a performance criterion of 1.28 gallons per flush uh, for tank type toilets. <laughs> and now, as of uh, 2012, there are 1,475 models on the market um, from, over, from 87 brands uh, that meet that standard. And in 2011, nearly 6 million of these uh, 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 stand, uh, toilets meeting that standard were shipped, um, which uh, we estimated is likely more than half of the total market nationwide in tank type toilets. Um, so these, these are uh, readily available. Uh, they come at no higher cost uh, than, uh, than other toilets as a result of their high efficiency. Um, in Consumer Reports toilet ratings, for example, from uh, 2012 uh, include uh, a number of models rated good and very good uh, that, uh, that meet this high efficiency standard, including uh, ac actually the two lowest priced uh, models on uh, on their ranking list at $100 a piece. Uh, I'd note that that the uh, this proposed standard of, of 1.28 uh, has been uh, adopted as a mandatory standard already in New York City. It took effect in 2012, uh, and and New York City is actually uh, engaging in a uh, a retrofit program, a toilet rebate program, to replace 800,000 toilets citywide. Um, the standard has also been adopted statewide in Georgia. Uh, in other cities where there have been retrofit or rebate programs, uh, customer satisfaction surveys have shown a high rate of, of satisfaction uh, among homeowners. Uh, so it, earlier this year, um, NRDC uh, proposed to the, uh, the Plumbing, Mechanical, and Fuel Gas Codes uh, Technical Subcommittee uh, to uh, uh, consider this change. Uh, we also proposed uh, several other changes for other fixtures that would uh, match the water sense water efficiency standards. Um, for, uh, for those other fixtures, the uh, faucets, uh, urinals, and shower heads, the technical subcommittee recommended moving ahead. Uh, for toilets, however, the committee expressed some concerns. Uh, and as I understand it from, uh, from Department of State staff, those concerns were based on uh, the uh, commercial building context. Uh, concerns that uh, lower flow toilets uh, with in building commercial buildings that have longer drain lines uh, could lead to clogging. Uh, we're not we, we believe that that's not, that's not actually uh, borne out by the evidence in the commercial context. But in any event, what we're asking today is to focus purely on the residential context, where it's our understanding that the technical subcommittee did not raise any concerns, um, and so therefore um, uh, we request that the uh, the code council. Um, uh, direct the, the subcommittee and or the staff to include in the, the package of uh, code revisions being prepared for the council's consideration uh, to include a, uh, an updated standard of 1.3 gallons per flush, um, basically rounded off from the 1.28 standard in, in the water sense criteria uh, for tank type toilets specifically and specifically in the residential code. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and also to provide uh, written uh, information about this request uh, following the meeting. Thank you, sir. If you do have uh, written information that uh, supports your comments, I would encourage you to send that to our office in Albany, and we will distribute that information to the Code Council. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark, would you introduce the next speaker, please? Uh, the uh, last speaker that we have is uh, Ed Helderman speaking on the residential code. Thank you guys for hearing me. Um, 
I'll try to be brief and not take up too much of your time. The reason I'm here today is because, well, let me introduce myself first of all. My name is Ed Hellerman. I'm the Post and Standards Manager for Superior Walls of America. Superior Walls builds precast concrete foundations and have been doing so since 1981, so been in business for 35 years. We have nine licensees across east of the Mississippi and cover 25 states with enough foundations. Two licensees operate in New York State, and they produce between 500 and 700 foundations a year. The reason I'm bringing this up is because New York State is planning to adopt provisions in the 2009 Residential Code, which contain at least 10 important specific sections and tables and figures on precast concrete foundations. I did notice that I read the summary from the Technical Residential Committee, and there were two sections missing from their summary, so I will follow up with a letter as well and send it to the Council, just so that you guys know what all the sections are. And they did approve or consent to all the provisions that are in the 2009, and the only reason I'm here is just to encourage your approval, because it does contribute largely to the economic function of New York State. And that's it. Thank you. I'm not going to take up too much more. Thank you for your comments, sir. Just one note, the Code Council is currently reviewing, and through the Technical Subcommittees, the 2012 International Residential Code. So you mentioned the 2009, so I would just make that clarification. Oh, okay. And as you, it sounds like you're going to do it anyway, but if you have some written information that you'd like to present to the Council, send it to our office and we will distribute it. There are a couple of mistakes in the 2009 Code that were corrected in the 12, so that's actually good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. All our speakers? Okay. That completes the Technical. We have another special speaker in New York City. There's an additional speaker here in New York City. Okay. We didn't have that information. Could you identify yourself? I'm not quite sure who it is. It's Sal Ferrara. I'm representing the electrical industry. Okay. Mr. Ferrara, if you'd like to make some brief comments, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Sal Ferrara. A little background. I am an IEI member, just like Mr. McBride. I also teach the Electrical Code in Long Island. I also sit on, I also teach for the Department of State Electrical Codes, and I represent the electrical industry, and I'm taking in consideration to adopt the latest code, which is the 2014. And let me just bring up some issues that are very important that everybody should be aware of. A, with the new technology, such as electrical vehicles, Article 625, solar photovoltaic, Article 690, and in the 2008 code, and here it is right here, there's nothing on wind turbines. In the 08 code, you have no article about wind turbines, and they're going up all over New York State. So remember, the NEC is only the minimum requirements, and we're not even meeting the minimum requirements where we're doing installation. So it's imperative that we stay up to date with the latest codes. And remember, the code, if you read 90.1, it's to protect who? The public. It's to protect the public. And if we don't have an updated code, we're just not protecting the public. And now let me just give you an analogy. As soon as an iPhone or a cell phone comes out, what do we do? We buy it. It's the latest technology. Here, we're in the 2008 code, six years behind, and we're not staying up to date. So I plead you to consider the 2014 code. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, we've completed agenda item number three. We're going to move on to agenda item number four, petroleum bulk storage regulations, 6 NYCRR part 613, draft revisions, and this is presented by the New York Department of Environmental Conservation. Mark, would you please introduce the agenda item? Yes, agenda item four. This concerns draft proposed regulatory changes by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation 
concerning petroleum bulk storage facilities. DEC, or excuse me, environmental conservation law requires DEC, when revising their petroleum bulk storage regulations, to consult with the Code Council to assure that such rules and regulations are consistent with the Uniform Fire Prevention Building Code. DEC sent a letter addressed to me for the Code Council requesting a review of their draft DEC regulations, or petroleum bulk storage regulations, for the purpose of identifying inconsistencies with the Uniform Code. Staff has reviewed these draft DEC regulations, and I have a couple comments to make, or some issues that we found that, in our opinion anyway, could pose a potential inconsistency with the Fire Code of New York State. The first one is with regard to the design and construction of petroleum storage tanks. The draft DEC regulations provides a list of standards, any one of which would satisfy their requirements, where tanks would have to meet those requirements. These reference standards are not the same as those that are referenced in the Fire Code. The Fire Code makes reference to the National Fire Protection Association standard NFPA 30, and within NFPA 30, there is a requirement that the design and construction of such tanks shall be in accordance with recognized engineering standards, and then it lists its standards that it finds acceptable and deemed to meet recognized engineering criteria, but they're different than what is in the draft DEC regulations. So what you would have is the possibility of the authority having jurisdiction, potentially not accepting the DEC standards and only going by what is in NFPA 30, but it certainly opens the door for the authority having jurisdiction could accept the DEC standards that are listed, but if they didn't, that could be the potential inconsistency or conflict. This similarly occurs with piping standards for petroleum products. The standards in the draft DEC regulations are also not the same as those prescribed by the Fire Code. Another issue is the transfer procedures in the draft DEC regulations. They reference NFPA 385 for their transfer procedures or the American Petroleum Institute standard 1007. These are not standards that are listed in the Fire Code. The Fire Code specifies its own transfer procedures. The Fire Code does not reference another reference standard for that. The underground tank repair standards are also not the same. DEC lists eight standards by which you can repair underground storage tanks, and the Fire Code only references one standard, that would be NFPA 30. And the last potential inconsistency is for out-of-service underground storage tanks. The draft DEC regulations will provide a mechanism for out-of-service storage tanks that have been out of service for more than 12 months to be able to remain open, whereas the Fire Code of New York State specifically says that if they're out of service for more than 12 months, they have to be abandoned in place or removed entirely from the ground. And that concludes our review. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Before we begin any discussion, are there any questions from members of the Council for Mark on his presentation or the draft comments that he has explained to you? Any questions from the Council? Okay. I see no questions. What we are 
looking for is uh, some discussion from the members of the council on uh, on Mark's analysis. And if the code council endorses that analysis, we would submit that to the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, we have uh, shared the the draft comments with DEC, so they are aware of uh, of our uh, initial staff analysis, but they also understand that that is only a draft and uh, is subject to endorsement from the council. So with that, uh, let's let's open discussion. Is there any discussion that the council would like to uh, undertake? <coughs> Okay, I see. I see no discussion. I'm sorry. Is there, John. Mr. Lee? Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify what I gathered from the staff memo is that the code council is going to recommend to DEC to not proceed at this time until these outstanding uh, potential conflicts have been resolved and that. Further investigation into additional to uncover additional conflicts will be necessary. Mark, would you like Is to that the recommendation? You want to answer that? John, John, could you repeat that? I just wanted to clarify that based on the staff memo, which included the comments that you've just reviewed, is that we are going to recommend to DEC to hold off on proceeding with. Uh, these changes until we have had or DEC have had uh, enough time to further review to uncover any other additional conflicts? Well, I, I did have a conversation with a representative of DEC. Um, he acknowledged receiving my comments. Um, he also acknowledged that they received uh, around 250 other public comments and they are, they're addressing those comments as well as the ones that I, I provide to them. Uh, I also made it clear to them that my comments were, were, they were exactly that, my comments, and should not be considered as being coming from the Code Council. But my understanding is that they took up my comments very seriously and that they're working on them right now. Okay, well then I would just like to add to the discussion then that I first um, endorsed the comments that were submitted by Mark that um, I agree with uh, the, that uh, there are certain conflicts there that ought to be addressed before DEC proceeds. And I would like to point out that uh, these have been reviewed locally by our own uh, departments of buildings and environmental protection, and there are um, some inconsistencies with our local regula regulations, and our own local agencies have also submitted comments to DEC uh, highlighting those conflicts. Thank you. Uh, additional discussion? I have a question. Mr. Torpy. Uh, in this analysis, is, is the, uh, the end result, are they asking us as states here to confirm that there are no conflicts with the uniform, uniform fire prevention and code council? Is that what they're, uh, they're asking us to, to say that we realize that there are no conflicts when I'm seeing here that there are conflicts? That's what they, that is what they're asking for, yes. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I, I think I think they're asking of, um, us to confirm that there are no other conflicts um, other than those that we might highlight or identify. So, as a council, uh, we're in a position here that I mean, as a council member, I mean, I'm being advised that there are conflicts. So yeah, as a vote, I have to vote against the recommendation to accept this. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I think what what they're looking for is is uh, for us for the co-council to identify the the inconsistencies that the code council um, has discovered here, and and then and they, I, I believe they're asking for after that list is provided to them to sign off on the rest of it as as, as though there are no other possible inconsistencies. Okay, thank you. Mr. Altieri. That becomes a kind of <coughs> task. What we were given was 140 something pages. I'm sure what Mark uh, highlighted was highlights of what you saw. I'm 
guessing staff has not gone through every single item to compare it. That's what they're looking for. That's impossible to say line item by line item, everything agrees. So if, if there's a vote, I would vote against it. It's just impossible. Mr. Flanagan? I would like to congratulate the staff for coming through this and looking at the 142 pages there. Because there's a lot in here. Because I started going through that and, you know, start wondering, fine. And then I went to Mark's remarks and I looked at those and then I came from that. Is that all of them? We don't know that's all of them. There may be more in there that may pop up tomorrow by something else that's <coughs> that changes or whatever happens or where the site is or what it, different uh, things like that. So it would make it really make it uh, sort of tough to say we agree that there are no more conflicts because I don't think we can ever say that there are no more conflicts or that more conflicts would not arise. <coughs> well, uh, depending upon the outcome of this discussion, whatever comments the council determines are, are appropriate to forward to DEC would have to be presented in the appropriate context. Uh, if the council is not comfortable, uh, quote unquote, confirming, then, then we need to make sure that uh, that uh, DEC understands the council's position. And we certainly would do that. Mr. Lee. Uh, I would disagree that it is impossible to uh, go through the whole document. And I think there ought to be an obligation on at least the part of the codes divisions to review the DEC regulations and do some due diligence to determine as comprehensively as possible to see whether or not there are conflicts. Um, and, and, and then to submit the, the full uh, set to DEC. Um, although I have a question is, does DEC have any obligation to receive our approval before proceeding or is this just a matter of courtesy? Yes, no. oh. Joe, would you like to try answering that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will. Uh, <laughs> the, the statute provides that the Department of Environmental Conservation is required to consult with the Department of State, or I, I'm sorry, with the Code Council uh, to assure that the DEC rules and regulations are consistent with the Uniform Code. So I, I, I read that as saying it's incumbent upon DEC to adopt regulations that are consistent with the Uniform Code, and it's supposed to be a two-way street. When they consult with the Code Council, the Code Council consults with them and, and assists them in their efforts to make sure that their regulations are consistent with the Uniform Code. At the same time, they may point out inconsistencies and they may point out reasons why they feel the, the regulations that they adopt uh, should vary with the Uniform Code with the suggestion that perhaps the Uniform <coughs> Code should be amended to, to, to conform with their regulations. And that's particularly appropriate at this time since we are now looking at um, an update to the Uniform Code. And they, they may, for example, feel that the federal statute that they are implementing uh, has certain requirements. So there may be a certain degree of preemption by the federal statute that would require the state, both the DEC regulations and the Uniform Code, to be consistent with federal law. So I think there should be a dialogue between DEC and, and the Code Council. And perhaps the Code Council should uh, ask the Codes Division here at the Department of State to <coughs> continue that dialogue to provide to the DEC uh, the list of potential inconsistencies that Mark has identified. Say this is a preliminary list. There may be others. So far, we've identified these. Let's work together to make sure that you develop regulations that are consistent with any overarching federal requirements and also consistent with the Uniform Code. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Joe. So then with that, then I would recommend that we uh, request additional time from DEC for staff to do a comprehensive review of the changes before recommending to DEC whether or not to proceed with this. Is that in the form of a motion, Mr. Lee? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs>
Is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay. Second by Mr. Vatter. Let's take discussion on the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion that the council would like to uh, take on, on this matter before we move to the next agenda item? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item number five, more restrictive local standards. Village of Hastings on Hudson Local Law Number 6 of 2013. Uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you to introduce the agenda item, but I know that we have some representatives from the village here. So uh, if you could also uh, introduce uh, uh, our colleagues from the Village of Hastings. Okay. Uh, before I move on to that, uh, I just uh, I just want to interrupt and ask uh, Sal Ferrara in uh, the New York City office if you could contact us after the co-council meeting about uh, completing an appearance form because you had spoken earlier. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, agenda item five, Village of Hastings on Hudson. Uh, this is in regard to a green uh, building code provisions uh, in the village of Hastings on Hudson. Uh, it is the village's intent, uh, as described within the law, to minimize negative impact on the environment, uh, reduce <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions, and require use of renewable energy sources and sustainable building products. The local law contains many features that are known to be green code features such as stormwater control, irrigation, bicycle racks, recycled materials, limitations on VOC content um, of uh, construction materials and so forth. Uh, is, is staff's opinion that these, these typical green code provisions are not anything that are uh, really construction standards and not in conflict with the uniform code or the energy code. However, uh, their local law does contain, contain features that are uh, directly related to um, energy code requirements that we also have in the state energy code. Um, such as the um, provisions for lighting controls, high efficiency heating and cooling equipment, energy, energy star compliance for fixtures and appliances. Any municipality is, uh, is allowed to adopt a, uh, an energy code, uh, provide that they, they um, file a copy of the local law with the code council. The code council can decide what, that the the uh, regulations uh, or the more the, the standards are uh, more stringent than the state energy code. In which case, the municipality is permitted to continue to enforce those provisions. If the code council determines that they are less stringent uh, than the state energy code, uh, then the the municipality would would not be able to continue to enforce those provisions. It's staff's opinion uh, uh, that the energy code provisions in the village of Hastings on Hudson's uh, local law are at least as stringent as the state energy code. I will also add that there, there is uh, one area in the, or actually it's the same topic, uh, appears in two sections in the, uh, the local law that uh, we believe is a construction standard because it, it interacts with what we already have in the plumbing code. Um, so it's not an energy code issue, um, but um, it, it does <coughs> potentially conflict with the, with the plumbing code, and that is one provision that deals with maximum flow rates of plumbing fixtures. Um, in most cases, the, the flow rates are that they prescribe are of uh, more restrictive than the plumbing code, but there's one instance, uh, in specifically for urinals, where we believe it's less restrictive than the plumbing code. Um, finally, uh, with regard to the, um, the flow of the plumbing fixtures, uh, that provision, staff was unable to find any, anything in the uh, petition that, um, that would identify what the special local conditions are that would, re that would uh, justify having a provision like that. 
Um, I do believe we have a rep at least one rep representative from the village of Hastings on Hudson. It's my understanding that the, that, that person uh, is, is um, has not asked to speak to the code council, but I would ask if, um, if, if they would like to anyway. Uh, before we do that, uh, sir, uh, just one second. Uh, you've heard you've heard a, a, a summary from uh, from Mark, and uh, before we uh, recognize Mr. Sharma to uh, to uh, present some comments on behalf of the village of Hastings on Hudson, I'd like to uh, I'd like to uh, call for a, a, a five minute break. We have one. Uh, one small item that we need to consult on, and then we will continue with the meeting. Uh, so it is 11 o'clock. We will uh, we'll go back on the record at 11:05. Thank you. I did too. What's the issue? I will go to the I will go to the I will go I does that count? It also was yeah. dated yeah. Yeah. October 30th, which means it implies that it was sent on the 30th. So the question is, do any of those things? I chose to let the courts be the best Doing this for writers and he's folks who just got their way about it now. Sure. I got, yeah, we'll talk, but I, I'll be back in touch with you. I don't want to stop you. So, all right, I appreciate that. But I chose to ignore that. I think Joe was in favor of that. Maybe he was in second but I did highlight that. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Really good idea. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Tanya has a very special nine year program. She's really in the most running. Bernard is probably working on this. Expected. Yeah. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. New Jersey. So, Peachy County's had a presidential. It's pretty gorgeous. I think we're on. Yeah. We have known each other for about five years. So, let's get a real fire death. Thank you. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that re yeah, I was going to say that report is four years old, but we're, well, yeah, we're, we're now technically seven years behind really the time. We're we're gonna we can vote in court. I've seen that. You know, I don't know if I actually have that. I have that. I have that. That's a nice piece. You should try to go in with my friends. No, I'm right. Yeah. Why are we even talking about this? Oh, the evidence is clear. Yeah. Here's the, here's the argument. 
Consumer choice, take it or leave it. Big government, wait for a couple days. Those are the three things. Just throw all the code in. Right. This is short. Every section is code. Not just one section. The whole code. So how is this? How is it? I was all sad because I was like, 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 so, whatever you guys can do. This, this, this idea, this idea makes too much sense to actually happen in government. We're going to give it a shot. Yeah, I got it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Where are you now in the this issue to the front of the pack because Probably six months. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to uh, take your seats. We're going to uh, continue with the meeting shortly. Kevin, you're going to talk? Sure. Okay. All right, are we ready to go? Everybody set? Okay, we're going to continue with the meeting. We'll go back on the record. Can I have your attention, please? Uh, I'd like to ask uh, before uh, the village makes its presentation if there are any questions <coughs> that the, the uh, members of the council have for Mark and his uh, introduction. Any questions for Mark? Okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce Devin Sharma, the code enforcement official for the village of Hastings on Hudson. Welcome, Mr. Sharma. Please make your presentation. Same. My name is Devin Sharma. I'm an architect as a building for the official for the village of Hitchin Hudson. When Michael asked me whether I would like to make a presentation, I didn't think it would be necessary because the gap here is quite clear and obvious. Uh, about two years ago, a little over two years ago, we invited on um, Easter and Dodgy Harris in 2015 to help us get started. We found the need as we start working on the sustainability and the green of the curve. Uh, representatives of the people of the village of Hates and Hudson felt the need at that time we had to do it. And when Peter and John Harris got started, gave some ideas to the IGCC that was in the process of the formulated so, so. professor Open the first public hearing in the platform. And we were hoping that maybe IDCC will come into picture soon enough and maybe some states, including New York State, will perhaps will adopt it. But in the meantime, we thought we, we, we could go ahead and put something together that would work for a small municipal like ours. What have we done here? I think we have made uh, 20, 30 people from our community. 
from, you know, from all walks of life. Uh, and then you formed a smaller technical committee made up essentially of architects. And we put together this very concise and to the point sort of uh, code, least amount sort of thing that we would want to do uh, by way of acknowledging, uh, understanding the concepts of human code and uh, following the, the thoughts and the concepts uh, which we believe are the right way to go. Some of uh, the more stringent requirements by way of uh, flow rates, water use, uh, we've done it with, with an idea. Among us, we always discuss are these fixtures or appliances ready or available, and whether there is any premium cost for getting it. And we convinced ourselves that was not the case. We also actually believe that uh, while we do this, soon enough, it will become part of the state code as well in the, in the coming versions of it. And as a uh, representative from New York State, uh, no, I think some speaker talked about uh, the total fixes of 1.28 uh, per crush uh, rate. We, we adopted that in, the, in, in this code, in the full non that those kind of fixes are generally and easily available. Um, other than that, uh, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, but we are very happy we adopted it, I think, for four months ago. And uh, we filed it with the state as we were uh, exposed to. And now I realize that uh, uh, some conservation that we were doing by making copies, two sided copies, when we sent to the state, we only sent them one cracked it and scanned it and once one side of the copy, so we're going to take care of that. And uh, then we realize we need to bring this to the attention of corporation as well before we can um, touch upon some of the building codes and funding provisions. That's why we're here. And we have to answer the Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Uh, are there any questions that members of the council have for Mr. Sharma representing the village? Okay, thank you for your presentation. Okay. okay, you have a petition from the village of Hastings on Hudson uh, before you uh, requesting approval. Uh, I'll entertain discussion on from the council on this petition. Let's take discussion. <laughs> I have a couple of questions that concern how this code dovetails with the construction code where the requirements pertain uh, to issues covered in the uh, in the building code or the residential code. And specifically, I'm looking at page 13 where it talks about certified wood and the requirement that the, the village is proposing is to use a minimum of 50% of wood-based materials that are certified by the Forest Stewards Council for wood building components. If we were constructing a wood frame building uh, in accordance with the building code or the residential code, the, there would be requirements for the certification of that wood. And these requirements would be on top of that, I assume. Is that how you would read this requirement? Uh, and the reason I ask this is if the only requirement was to be certified by the Forest Stewards Council, that would be deemed to be more restrictive, except that the Forest Stewards Council does not have any requirements or does not address certification of the wood for, uh, for grading purposes, for example. The question is, as, you, as I mentioned, is how, how do these two codes dovetail together? Uh, Gary, my response would be that the um, the wood would still have to be certified as required uh, as a quality um, uh, um, or a um, as required the residential code. 
but that this green code requirement in the village's local law would be merely an additional requirement on top of that. So it would basically have two stamps on it, or maybe even more stamps than that, but at least two stamps. One, to guarantee the quality of the wood for structural purposes, and this provision here for green code purposes. And I guess, and that answers my question there, and I guess it answers my question about another issue on page 13, where both the residential and commercial codes talk about utilizing salvaged, refurbished, or reused materials. I assume then that even though there has to be 50 percent, or has to be, the sum of materials used has to be at least 5 percent based on cost of reused materials. Those reused materials still have to comply with, whether it's the mechanical code, the plumbing code, or the building code, for where it addresses reused materials. Is that correct? I would agree, yes. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sharma, would you like to make a clarification? Yes, please. You see, the green code, there are certain mandatory requirements, and then there are optional choices, you know, certain points. Some of these are much more stringent and may not be possible in some instances, so it actually gives people the options to do it or not do it. So these are optional for additional points, and there are a whole list of things that you can choose from to meet that additional point. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Additional discussion? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the council on this petition? Mr. Lee. I have a question for staff. In the memo that was submitted to us, the last thing that they list in terms of recommendations was that the village of Hastings on Hudson should complete their application by submitting the appropriate MRLS form. But I thought that they did, so could you just first clarify whether or not their application was complete and that we are at this time entertaining the MRLS? Okay. Mike Auerbach is a staff who reviewed and was our primary reviewer of the petition. Mike, would you like to answer that question? Yes. The application did not contain the standard forms for MRLS for the building construction code. It contained a form that was filed with the Department of State. You have that in your packet. You can see that there was not the appropriate form for it. Nevertheless, further in the recommendation, there were a couple of other things that weren't addressed. They weren't all identified as well as the special conditions. I don't know if that answers it or not. That's what I was trying to express when I wrote that. So if there's not a complete application before us today, then what is it that we are entertaining? One opinion is my opinion, that you can vote on the energy code or take action on the energy code and recognize that those provisions that are in conflict, those portions that are in conflict with the building code would not be able to be enforced or accepted. Mike, do you want to make a clarification? Yes. When I introduced the topic, I mentioned that staff was not able to find any identified special conditions, special local conditions that would, as required in the executive law for uniform code or design construction issues. And when I said that, that was my response to the fact that we didn't believe it was complete because on that one topic, because it didn't identify any special conditions. And just adding to that, 
when reviewing a petition for a more restrictive local standard that includes energy provisions and provisions related to the uniform code you're looking at two different processes as mark mentioned the process under article 11 for of the energy <coughs> for reviewing a local energy code the code council needs to determine if the local code is more restrictive at least as restrictive or more restrictive than the state energy code if it finds that the provisions are more restrictive then the code council shall adopt those that there is that it, the code council has an obligation to adopt a more restrictive energy code with respect to provisions <coughs> related to the uniform code the code council has has to look at first of all are the provisions more restrictive than provisions of the uniform code if so then do the uh, provisions meet uh, accepted engineering standards and has the community identified special conditions that warrant the adoption of the more restrictive local standards so you have to look in this particular case since it since it appears that there are energy code provisions and unif and provisions that relate to the uniform code you have to look at those separately so um, you know I know how this group loves to talk about special conditions so can I give first a clarification that under the article uh, and excuse me if I got a number wrong but article 11 provision for a MRLS on the energy code there is no special conditions obligation is that correct that's correct okay so if we approve uh, uh, MRLS on the energy code then uh, Hastings has to go back re, uh, submit a, a second MRLS application for the building code and then does the fact that they have a more restrictive energy code at that time create a special condition to warrant the MRLS on the building code <laughs> Well, let's, let's start with the procedure for uh, submitting a, a second petition related to the uniform code. Joe, I'd, I'd like to ask for a clarification from your perspective if that's something that would be necessary uh, for the village to do. It's been a long time since I was in law school, but I'm reminded of the law school hypothetical. It is the very confusing question that's presented and very difficult to explain in 25 words or less. <clears throat> this green code is is a hybrid. It's a, it's it has some energy related provisions in it. It has a, a very few a handful, I guess, of construction related provisions in it. And it has uh, quite a few provisions in that are neither energy related nor construction related. Uh, slight modification of what Ron said regarding Article 11. Uh, Article 11 authorizes a local government to adopt a local energy conservation construction code. That's to be distinguished from Article 18 of the executive law that authorizes local governments to adopt individual construction standards so I think that the the energy the executive law article 18 contemplates that a local government will adopt not a complete building code but rather a discrete set of construction standards that are more strict than the uniform code article 11 of the energy code on the other uh, energy law on the other hand contemplates that local <laughs> governments be permitted to adopt a complete energy construction code almost to replace the state energy code within the local government <coughs> uh, this code is clearly not doesn't purport to be correct me if I'm wrong uh, a complete energy code it simply has in it some provisions that are energy related and I think the a, a suggested finding that uh, Mike Auerbach prepared and submitted to the code council would reflect that it would say to the to the village to the extent your local law has some energy related provisions in there they they, they coexist with the energy code they both of those provisions exist the energy code continues to apply in its entirety in the village 
and you have some energy related provisions if you wish to apply them on top of the energy code please feel free to do so if there's a conflict between the two the energy code always prevails so to the extent that you have a local energy requirement that exceeds the energy code if you wish to apply it that's your prerogative but you're not attempting to replace the entire state energy code in the village just to in effect supplement it with these provisions in addition to that there is the aspect of an application for approval of more restrictive construction standards and in fact the form that was used to submit this documentation to the code council was on the form used for approval of more restrictive construction standards under article 18 of the executive law fortunately the material presented by the village did not include any information discussing special conditions in the village that would warrant adoption by the code council of those more restrictive construction standards and it's also my understanding that staff believes at least one of the construction standards is in fact less restrictive than the than the uniform code so it seems that an appropriate approach for the code council might be to deny the petition to the extent that it seeks pardon me approval of more restrict of construction standards on the ground that the construction standards in the local law are either less restrictive than the uniform code or even if they are more restrictive the village has not established the existence of special conditions that that warrant the special the special local more restrictive construction standards in the village and then that separate from that that the code council authorized the village to continue to enforce the energy provisions in its local law with the understanding that they do not replace in any way shape or form any part of the energy code the energy code continues to apply in its entirety in the village i hope that makes sense because i can't repeat it that's what i meant to say thank you thank you joe so does that provide some clarification regarding uh what what the code council's role here is i hope i put them all to sleep excellent okay uh uh mr higby uh are you do you want to entertain a couple more questions about how this uh code works and whether there are inconsistencies uh specifically since uh joe mentioned uh this would be a supplement to the building code i know that under definitions page two gary excuse me it would be a supplement to the energy code supplement to the energy code okay well maybe that answers my question but i'll pose it anyway the definitions used for alteration for addition for repair are different from those used in the building code but this is the energy code does that create any uh inconsistencies with how it's uh how it would be applied that's one question and if i can go on to the other one we also talked about where it's less restrictive than the building code under efficient framing albeit efficient framing is listed as as an option i think to earn points i'm i question whether a definition that says optimizing the use of frame materials by limiting waste or and or using framing efficient measures such as constitutes sufficient information to determine whether those framing methods are consistent with the construction code mark do you want to try to answer that uh i i'll try to answer the first part of your question and that is uh the uh you pointed out that the definitions in the local law are different than what we have in the uniform code or the um or the energy code and uh i guess i i would give my opinion is that these definitions are there to be applied only for the purpose of the local law of the village of hastings on hudson 
and would not be used as definitions to replace those in the uniform code or the energy code so i i would not see a conflict in that um your second question i i, I guess i'd have to ask you to repeat that um well I'm not sure. the uh the definition section also refers to efficient framing and then further on in the law it uh, it talks about where points can be earned meaning that efficient framing is an option. My question is whether this efficient framing that it talks about is, number one, detailed enough to be able to guide uh, enforcement of the provision, and number two, whether in any event it's uh, uh, restrictive enough to comply with the building construction code. But for example here, it talks about using two stud corners. Now, I don't know whether two stud corners are permitted under the uh, residential code or the building code. But it also, and it also talks about uh, sizing headers for their actual loads instead of what's just given in the framing uh, guide. Uh, those may or may not be uh, violations uh, under the construction code. But the real question is if if the only guide for somebody to determine efficient framing is the statement uh, by using framing efficient measures such as, that seems to open up a wide area of, of, uh, of, of uh, framing measures and construction techniques that would not be consistent with building construction code. So how, how, does, how do we review that as a measure that's less restrictive than the construction code, or, or, or what would you guess? Um, well, <clears throat> it, the way I see it, the, um, the uniform code does not have any, um, any requirement for efficiency, uh, efficient framing. Uh, it has minimal requirements to resist design loads uh, but it doesn't have a maximum requirement. Uh, you could design a beam to carry um, 50 pounds and, and instead put a beam in there that could carry um, 20,000 pounds. Um, so the efficiency standard that they have in the local law, I, I don't think conflicts in any way in any construction standards of, in the uniform code. You mentioned the two stud corner um, requirement uh, we did have a discussion of this in our office, and <clears throat> in the residential code and the building code, uh, there's, there's, um, there's, there are prescriptive requirements, and the residential code has a prescriptive requirement for um, three stud corners. I'm not sure if it has two stud corners. It does. Okay, I guess it does. But my point was that because the residential code has those prescriptive standards. It also has a, a, a statement at the beginning of the code that says that if you choose not to use the prescriptive standards, you can actually engineer um, the building in other ways in compliance with the building code or, or any other recognized engineering practice. So um, my answer to that is you could actually, if you can engineer it, you could have a corner without any studs at all. Um, so I um, I don't I don't see that as being conflict with the uniform code. I hope I've answered your question. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Lee. Uh, I also <coughs> would like to add that um, if we are entertaining this as uh, MRLS over the energy code at this time. Uh, the vast majority of these provisions are not within the scope of the energy code. As, For example, as uh, staff has uh, pointed out that the uh, urinal flush flow rates are uh, less restrictive than what's in the state code, that's not within the energy code. Um, you know, water conservation is not one of the aspects covered. So if I, I guess I'm looking for a confirmation that I'm understanding this correctly that if we adopt this MRLS for the energy code, the parts that are potentially in conflict with um, the uniform code is not 
within consideration of that scope. We're only really talking about the parts that address the energy code, correct? That, that would depend upon the motion that the council uh, was to was to adopt. So, as much as much as I'd like to say this could be a simple motion, it's probably going to have to be at least a two-part motion. One which addresses the council's intentions with respect to the energy code. One which addresses the council's intentions with respect to provisions that relate to the uniform code. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Ron, if I could add, Joe? I'm sorry to add a clarification. Again, the Code Council does not adopt more restrictive energy standards. The Code Council's task with respect to local energy conservation construction codes is to find if they are or are not more restrictive than the state energy code. So again, I think in this case, the Code Council could very well determine appropriately that this green code is not a more restrictive local construction, local energy conservation construction code. It is a local law that contains certain energy requirements and to the extent that uh, the village applies this local law, the energy code continues to apply in its entirety. Any energy related provision of the local law that is more strict than the energy uh, state energy code can be applied and enforced by the village. Uh, any provision in the local law that is less strict than the state energy code is, is overridden by the state energy code, the state energy code prevails. To the extent that the local law contains construction provisions, whether they're one specifically identified by the staff in its memo or not, uh, the local law must fail because if these provisions are less strict than the uniform code, then of course they fail. And even if they are more strict than the uniform code, they fail because the village has not established special conditions that would justify the more strict construction standards. So if somebody finds a provision in the local law dealing with three corner studs or anything else, and if that is, if, if the local law would require something in addition to a construction requirement imposed by the Uniform Code, that provision of the local law would not be enforceable. If the local law establishes a construction requirement that is less strict than the Uniform Code, that provision would not be enforceable. The, the difficulty we have here is, of course, it's a local law that, that, that goes over three areas. It covers material, a little bit of material covered by the Uniform Code, it covers a little bit of material covered by the Energy Code, and it covers a lot of material covered by neither the Energy Code nor the Uniform Code. Okay, I'm going to take a little uh, prerogative of the Chair. I'm going to ask if there's a member of the Council that would be willing to accept that in the form of a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lee? Uh, I will accept exactly what Joe Ball said in the form of a motion. <laughs> Is there a second to the motion? Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second by Mr. Torpy. Let's take discussion on the motion. Mr. Batter? I don't disagree with any of this. Just, I was, before you were, chose to exercise chair discretion, I, my question was going to be something is, do we send this back with some sort of recommendation that says split it up so it makes sense to do that? But I think I'll just stand with and join uh, Mr. Lee um, with the motion. But if that was my, it was going to be like, get it. But there's three elements here that are very discreet uh, and 
as a unit, there's nothing to do but say no to it. And you don't really want to go there because that doesn't make complete sense either. So I'm going to join with the motion. Okay. Thank you. I think the details will have to be worked out on a case-by-case basis. If somebody applies to the village for a building permit and the village says you must do this, that person will say, wait a second, the uniform code doesn't require that. You're going too far. If the person says the energy code does not require that, the village can say, yes, but our local law does. And we can enforce the energy-related requirement in our local law because it's stricter than the state energy code. And that's how that will have to be worked out. This is an issue we will continue to address as communities adopt and present, for lack of a better term, green codes to the council. If you remember the first presentation that was made to the council, I think it was either the earlier this year or maybe even last year on the IGCC, the National Model Code for Green Construction, we identified that there are essentially three distinct groups of provisions that the code council would be looking at. One would be energy provisions that fall under one statute. One would be provisions that relate to the uniform code that fall under another statute. And the third would be provisions that fall, that the council has no business in considering, whether it's local zoning or other issues that don't relate either to the energy or the uniform code. So these are going to be complex issues that we're going to have to address as we go through. So let's see if there's any additional discussion. Mr. Higbee? First of all, I'd like to say that I think that for the village to enact a vote such as this is certainly a worthy goal, and any village to enact this would be a worthy goal. But I'm concerned that if with the motion that's on the floor, we'd be sending it back, unless I've misunderstood it, we'd be sending it back to the village to say, here, you're going to have to look at what sections are not enforceable because they are not as strict as the construction code. And that really falls on the permit applicant and the code enforcement official. I think that creates some confusion. And I think that if we're going to see more of these petitions and we act in a similar manner, we're going to have codes that become a vast departure from our goal of having a uniform code, even though we're talking about an energy code here, because it's getting into the construction area, that could create problems. So I think it's really upon us to send it back to the village with ask them to separate out the components that are not part of an energy code, are not as restrictive as the construction code, and resubmit. Okay. Thank you. Additional discussion on the motion? Mr. Flanagan? I would just make the comment, having read through it quite extensively, that building department is going to have to have about 20 people in to be able to keep up with everything that has to be done as you go through this, because everything goes to the building inspector at his approval, and he has to approve it. So you're going to have to, it's not an easy thing to do if you read through this whole thing, because he or his office has that problem here, because everything goes to the building department or to the building inspector. Additional discussion? Seeing none, let's take a vote on the motion. Everyone clear on the motion? Okay. I'm going to try to condense the motion. And Joe, feel free to chime in if I'm going astray. Essentially, 
the motion would be that the council uh, would allow the village of Hastings on Hudson to continue to enforce the provisions of, of its energy code that have that are contained in the local law as a supplement to the state energy conservation construction code which also applies and that the code council would disapprove the provisions that relate to the uniform code <coughs> Because, lo because special conditions have not been established. That'll do. Would they decide that it's more stringent? Uh, okay. okay. Wouldn't they have to decide it's more stringent than that? So does that does that provide clarification on the motion to everyone? Mr. Higby, uh, I still see an area where it, where it's not addressed, and that is where the provisions uh, we're talking about those that would be uh, where special conditions <laughs> would be applicable. That there's still no mention of what happens if it's less stringent than the construction code. A provision that is less stringent than the uniform code is automatically superseded by the uniform code. It is not enforceable by the local community. Gary, I think the, the motion contemplates that any and all construction related provisions uh, in the local law uh, be rejected for either or both of the uh, following reasons. Either they are less restrictive or no local uh, special conditions have been established. Uh, the fact that they are any provision that is less restrictive must be rejected by the code council. A provision that is more restrictive but not supported by special local conditions must be rejected by the code council. We have no special conditions, so therefore, in this case, it, it really makes no difference whether a particular construction standard is or is not more restrictive. In either case, it's rejected by the code council. Does that answer your question, Mr. Higby? I, uh, yes, it does, except I'm concerned with the, the document that the village now has with a council approval and disapproval and how they, uh, what do they do with that? How do they enforce that? Can they enforce it? Because as if we've determined that their energy code provisions are more restrictive and they're entitled to do that without submitting uh, more restrictive or, or special conditions, that can remain in effect, right? Correct. So, so they will have to go back and redo their local law before any of this is enforceable? Or is it not, going to be left sure up to the... And here's my concern. Is it going to be left up to, as John Flanagan said, the code enforcement official and the permit applicant to, to find their way through the weeds? That's what really is. Oh, are, are you like, are you, yes, 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 that is correct. One of the things that would happen if the council uh, <coughs> adopts this motion is our code development staff with, uh, with the assistance of our learned council will communicate with the village of Hastings on Hudson to, uh, to identify exactly what that how that action uh, applies with respect to the local law and, uh, and and provide essentially commentary that will hopefully allow the community to understand the the extent to which the council has uh, has endorsed the provisions of the local law specifically those that are related to energy Does that answer your question? It, it answers my question. It doesn't alleviate my concerns. Okay. Mr. Lee. As a member that uh, 
you know, threw in this motion, uh, I have to also completely agree with Mr. Higbee that while I think, you know, from a technical legal perspective, we are doing the probably the best we can with this motion. At the end of the day, the uh, on the ground situation for Hastings on Hudson is going to be an administrative nightmare. So um, I, while I don't want to amend the motion, I'd like to uh, have some assurance of a mechanism in place to communicate with Hastings on Hudson and to help them parse out uh, the energy code provisions from the other provisions that affect the uniform code so that at least from a uh, code administrative perspective, it makes it easier for uh, the town as well as the practitioners in the town. And again, it, as I had uh, as I had responded to Mr. Higby, that's exactly what our code development staff would do. Okay, thank you. Additional discussion. Seeing none, we'll take a vote on the motion. Let's take a roll call vote on the motion. Okay. <laughs> Mark, will you please call the roll? Ron Peaster? Yes. Paul Martin? Yes. Michael Cambridge? Yes. Maria Guzzati? Yes. John Lee? Yes. Nick Altieri? Yes. Michael Vatter? Yes. Willie Lightfoot? Yes. William Tucker? Yes. Gary Higby? Yes. John Flanagan? Yes. John Torpy? Yes. <coughs> okay, the motion passes. Uh, before we move on, uh, Mr. Higby and Mr. Lee, uh, I want to recognize uh, the validity of your concerns uh, and your comments. This is a complicated situation. Uh, and we understand that, uh, that the council's action here may not be readily apparent to someone either that has not attended this meeting or maybe even to some who are here right now. Uh, our uh, <laughs> And so it is the job of, of our code development staff to make sure that, that the community understands fully and clearly what the code council has, uh, what action the council has taken and provide the assistance necessary so that the, the, commu the community can, uh, can enforce the provisions that, uh, that the code council has endorsed and also provide instruction to the community on those provisions that the Code Council has not endorsed. So, uh, I, I, and what we'll do is uh, at, at the next Code Council meeting, we will uh, we'll provide a follow-up to all of you on our, our meeting with, uh, with the village uh, to give you a, a status on, on how that, how that uh, communication went, just so that you, you, can, uh, you, can, you can see that the follow-up has occurred, okay? Thank you, Ron. Mr. Higby, uh, if you have time for a quick question, uh, I'm curious to know whether you've had feelers from other communities also uh, interested in, a, in a, enacting a, a green building code, and if so, how many, roughly? There, uh, there have been there have been some communications that that, uh, that I've had uh, with uh, with a couple. Terry, we actually uh, talked with the. I think it's the village of Terrytown, uh, and there is there's also a, uh, for lack of a better term, a consortium of uh, of municipalities in Westchester County that are discussing uh, issues of green construction and sustainability. Uh, I also know that there are communities on Long Island that are having similar discussions. However, I don't believe that we've uh, received any. Uh, any petitions or any direct communications, but I would ask Mark and the code development staff if they've heard. So from Terrytown, we have. We passed. From from Terrytown, we've had we've received the one from Terrytown, but that's <coughs> the extent of it. Does 
that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number six, uh, next uniform code and energy code update. Uh, as you heard uh, dur at the beginning of the meeting with some of the uh, remarks that, that Mark had made, uh, that we are, we are continuing to review and work on the, the final technical subcommittee report, uh, the residential code technical subcommittee report, uh, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately are not prepared to present that to you at this time. Uh, we are, as soon as we can do that, we will uh, we'll present that report to you. Uh, and uh, and will uh, and will complete the the code council's uh, review and preparation for uh, the general uh, code update. Uh, we've also and Mark, I'd like to ask if you could uh, give us a uh, just a brief summary of, of some of the other uh, proposals or comments that we've received regarding sustainability. Uh, yes, uh, we. Um, we have received some code change proposals on, on sustainability of buildings um, to help withstand uh, damage and recovery uh, after an event um, similar to Hurricane Sandy. Um, we'll be looking at those. Um, they will include or, or may include uh, provisions that would increase the uh, lowest floor elevation of buildings within flood hazard areas to at least the base flood elevation plus two feet. Uh, this is what we have uh, already in the residential code, uh, but uh, we'll be looking in it uh, in terms of uh, the, the building code as well. Um, relocating mechanical and electrical systems in, in flood hazard areas uh, to enhance emergency generation uh, generator requirements for hospital senior centers, firehouses, and police stations, and updating the, um, the reference standard uh, for flood-resistant design construction, ASCE 24, to the 2013 edition. Uh, we also have some other code change proposals that um, um, not directly related to sustainability that we will also be forwarding to the Code Council with, with some recommendations. One of one of which uh, was mentioned in a uh, in a uh, comment during the public comment period. One of the benefits of uh, of uh, taking more time to uh, to update the code is we now we now have uh, have the ability to uh, to move to the latest edition of the National Electrical Code, which uh, which is something that uh, we hear from industry uh, on an almost constant basis. And so uh, that is a that is a recommendation that we will be forwarding. To you as well. Uh, with respect to the energy code, as you know, uh, we have uh, we have developed essentially rulemaking documents to update the commercial provisions of the energy code, uh, reflecting uh, or to essentially move to adopt uh, the ASHRAE 90.1 2010 uh, as a commercial energy code, and to uh, and and to establish. Uh, consistent provisions uh, for commercial energy through the IECC, the 2012 IECC. We, uh, we were waiting for a report from the Pacific Northwest Laboratory, which is a uh, essentially a, a branch of the Department of Energy. Uh, we were waiting for a report from them that would establish parity between the two, 2012 IECC and the 2010 edition of ASHRAE, um, so that we, which would uh, be necessary uh, as part of our justification uh, to present uh, rulemaking documents under the State Administrative Procedure Act. We received that report from PNNL. You might Im imagine a, uh, a, a an analysis report that is uh, that is developed by a branch of the U.S. Department of Energy. Takes some time. To uh, to analyze, uh, but at the same time, uh, we we have been communicating with uh, DOE and PNNL, uh, and they are they have indicated that they're uh, actually refining that report. So they've uh, actually it's the okay. Uh, it's 
cost effectiveness. The cost effectiveness report, excuse me. So TNNL is in the process of refining that report. We're hoping that we will have the revised report shortly, and that will then give us the ability to move forward with the commercial energy code rulemaking. So that's essentially an update. Our goal, as much as our goal was to have these codes in place by the end of 2013, we are hopeful that we will be able to update the uniform code and the energy code in 2014 and then have a new code in place. So, again, a lot of things have to happen between now and then. We appreciate your patience as we work through some of these challenging issues, but as soon as we have additional updates for you, we will make sure to present that. Mark, could you just brief the Code Council on our future meetings under Agenda Item 7? Sorry, Ron, I have a question on the energy code update. Mr. Lee, sorry. Thank you. Can you – I have two questions. First, the residential sections of the energy code, can you confirm that we do not need a report from the U.S. Department of Energy on findings because there is no comparison that is required? Is that correct? I'm going to look to – Joe, do you have a – The DOE has already determined that the residential provisions of the 2012 IECC are more energy efficient than the 2009 edition of the IECC, and since New York typically adopts the residential provisions of the IECC rather than – that is the target, so we don't have to have parity between that document and another one, such as a commercial where we need parity between the IECC and ASHRAE. In this case, we would be adopting the IECC in substantially as-is condition. Okay, so – That's a long way of saying no, we don't need another comparison. Okay, so this is ultimately leading to a question on scheduling then. If we're talking about 2014, then can we assume that it's likely that the commercial and residential sections are going to go at around the same time, if not at the exact same time? We don't know that. I could tell you we think it's going to happen, but we don't know that. We are anxious to move forward with the commercial energy provisions because of the federal deadline that had been established and the request for an extension of time that we have submitted to DOE. So while we would like to be able to do that for the sake of consistency, we may find it necessary to move forward with the commercial energy code provisions more aggressively because of the commitment that we have made with respect to the extension of the deadline for commercial energy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mark, could you give us a briefing on the meetings for 2014? The future meetings for 2014, I have rooms booked for 2014. The dates of February 19th, May 7th, August 20th, and November 18th. These are proposed dates for 2014. And the rooms have been established. If there are any other dates, we would have to look into it. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Mark on the dates? Mr. Flanagan? I would question the 19th of February being the Association of the Towns of New York in that week. Plus, it's a vacation week for most of the school districts in the state because it is Washington's birthday. So I just questioned that. Okay. So noted. We'll take a look at that a little bit more closely. Thank you. Okay. With no other questions, is there any other business that the council would like to bring to the table today? No. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Mr. Higby. I'd just like to make the comment that we had some uh, uh, some uh, very complicated issues today, and I thought that staff, despite being short manpower, did an outstanding job in, in laying out the issues and articulating the, the matters. Thank you for that comment. One of the things that, that uh, I think will uh, help us tremendously as we move toward uh, updating the Uniform Code next year, uh, we've actually been able to, uh, to hire some people uh, in the Codes Division, and that has allowed us to, uh, to ask Miriam MacGyver to come back and, uh, into the Code Development Unit. So Miriam is, is back, and, uh, and I think is going to be a great assistance to, uh, to Mike and Mark as, uh, as we go forward. So we're glad to have you back. Okay. Mark? Yes. Um, <clears throat> this meeting of the Code Council um, is, um, uh, is available to provide in-service training credits. And uh, in order to be um, assured of getting those credits, you would have to complete the, the form that we have out there. Michael Auerbach has that. And if you have not yet signed up for them, um, I, I would suggest you do so. Okay. Thanks. Good point. Uh, before we adjourn, I, I would like to make a comment uh, uh, on behalf of the Department of State. Uh, I would like to personally thank each member of the Code Council for your commitment and your dedication to the work we do here. Uh, as we've identified a few times, some of this work gets very complicated, uh, requires a lot, of, uh, a lot of homework, a lot of preparation, and we understand uh, that it is a large commitment of your time to do that. Uh, so I, I want to tell you how much we appreciate uh, what you do. For, uh, for the Code Council uh, and assure you that the work that you do helps to create a, uh, a, a safer, uh, more efficient, and more sustainable building stock for the state of New York. So thank you for your commitment. And I want to wish each of you and your families a very uh, happy, safe, and healthy holiday this year. Thank you very much. What's that? We have another quick thing? Just one more quick thing. One more quick Gary thing. says that he doesn't have as a trainer sign out. So. You don't? OK. So yes, we're in a class with more people. Oh. Yes, we're good. Okay. I know. I, I misled you. <laughs> the form says you have to sign out. Please see me as you leave to sign out. I misunderstood what Gary just said. Okay. Okay. For code enforcement, official training. I'll be outside. See me as you leave. Okay. I, so with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.